Welcome to another episode of Grief Talk. Everything you want to know about grief and more. I'm your host, Vaughn Solis. As an author, life transformation coach, online instructor, and bereaved mom since 2005, I'll be bringing you great content that is informative, inspiring, and practical. Whether you have suffered a loss or other adversity, stay tuned and tapped in as I cover a variety of topics to help you get where you want to go on your journey to heal and grow. Today's guest is Jessica Badonsky. Jessica is a nurse practitioner and founder of The Private Parts of Wellness, where she offers courses and coaching to help guide her clients back to the parts of them that lie dormant and forgotten. For the last 18 years plus, Jessica has explored wellness's private parts in the roles of doula, yoga instructor, nurse, now nurse practitioner, knowing that expanding in knowledge about self and body requires exploration of those parts of ourselves that are most private. The erotic has the power to motivate people to care for themselves more deeply, whether through sexual, artistic, or vocational expression. So welcome to the show, Jessica. I'm so excited you're here. Thank you, Vaughn, for inviting me. I've been uh, excited to be part of this. Yes, and in my growing community, you are without a doubt a super important voice. And I'm, um, I want to get to, um, you know, having you dive a little deeper into what you do and how you came to do it. So, but for my audience, I just want to introduce a little bit uh, about Jessica and how I came to know her. So we met uh, rather uh, recently on a networking site, which is amazing. And Jessica's work in um, erotic awareness, erotic development, she'll explain it a lot uh, more clearly than I can. Anyway, it drew us to have a conversation conversation together. And as we go along, I'll explain from the bereavement side of thing, uh, things or the broken side of things, quote unquote, broken side of things, what it feels like. I am a bereaved mother of a suicide um, in 2005 for an audience that doesn't know me. And I've struggled the last 17 years and I'm making some wonderful breakthroughs um, now, 17 years later, after losing my only daughter at the age of 22. And you can imagine it's been a real struggle. So it leaves parts of us um, dead and empty inside. And Jessica, we're going to speak about this hopefully a little bit. You have worked in palliative care as well. So you know all about bereavement. You know about the dying. Uh, you know about birthing as a doula, and you see how, how audience, how exciting this is going to be. And those parts of ourselves that become dead inside. I want to speak with you a little bit about that after we've had, you know, an initial conversation so the audience can understand more about your work, uh, explaining more about what erotic means and what wisdom means, which we'll get to in our second question. But... Um, if I could just turn the floor over to you and ask you to um, let our audience know uh, how you got into doing what you do. I know you are a nurse practitioner, and you may want to speak a little bit about that, and, and if it led you from traditional nursing into this more, I don't know, enhanced practice, and um, we'll take off from there. Over to you. So um, I... It's a, I'll try and be as condensed as I can. Um, years ago, before I became a nurse, uh, like when I was a kid, like a five-year-old, six-year-old kid, I wanted to be a mechanic, opera singing, obstetrician, gynecologist. That's what I wanted to be, right? And um, I learned about becoming a doula and I thought I was going to become a midwife. Hmm. So I started... I started to work as a doula and decided to go to nursing school. And in nursing school, um, I realized I was not going to be a midwife. Oh, okay. But I think that was one of the first times that I felt grief that um, wasn't related to a passing of a human being, like a grandparent, which was my other kind of association with grief. Because I associate, I kind of, I think about it as um, I had, it was like I had this lover who I was so madly in love with. And I realized 
I still love them, but I wasn't going to marry them. Right. Mm -hmm. And that pain. And when I decided I was not going to be a midwife, that's how it felt. I literally cried and said, thank you for accepting me into your program, but I'm not going to do this. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was very, very deep. It, it, that is how it felt. It felt like I was breaking up with somebody that I was so madly, madly in love with, but I knew we couldn't be married. Mm -hmm. Um, Fast forward, I became a nurse and I worked on the floor, bedside nurse, a medical surgical nurse. So the beauty of the hospital that and the unit that I was on is that I saw everything. Yeah. Kidney issues, broken bones, uh, diabetic problems, uh, you know, surgical issues. And what happened is that I started to... Uh, I don't know. I don't even know how it popped in. You know, sometimes things just pop into your head and you start investigating. So I started to investigate female ejaculation. Okay. And that's a thing um, ish. Yeah. That may be at a different time, but I started to look at the structure of the body and this kind of phenomenon that was happening. And I was talking to a uh, the chief resident for the, the um, urology service. Mm -hmm. And she was like, Jessica, what are you talking about? We don't talk, we barely talk about men's sexuality in school. Yeah. We don't even talk about women's. Right. Which, uh, which I just want to ask, that's still true today, is it not? Kind of. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And oh, then when we okay. like, if we do talk about menopause, like that is like something that really people don't talk about. Right. Wow. Uh, they're starting to more and more, but you know, uh, understanding uh, even therapists don't talk about sex, right. You have to go and search uh, programs that will educate you on how to open up that conversation. But at the same time, people aren't taught about death either. No, true. No. So yeah, birth, sex and death. We only talk about birth, right? Yeah. Wow. Talk about it in this very, like the, I used to run this prenatal yoga class and I used to say, you know, birth is extraordinarily ordinary, right? Yeah. It's extraordinary to you because it's you and your yeah. family, but it's very ordinary to think yeah. of, right? Yes. Yes. I get that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, so um, anyway, what I started to see is that patients had questions about sex and sexuality mm -hmm. in relationship to whatever they were going through, whether it was a broken hip or having a knee replacement, right. Or having a hip replacement. So, or, um, having, a, a bowel obstruction, right? right. It was coming up for people. And the questions that they, they didn't know who to ask. Yeah. They didn't want to ask questions because they felt like they would be dismissed, which they were. I mean, I had one, one patient who had her knee replaced and it was her second knee replacement, I believe. And she was saying that the first time she had her knee replaced, she was 40 years old. Wow. And she had a young doctor who said she had asked about sex and the doctor looked at her and said, you still think about that? at 40. Like, come on. Wait, how long ago was this? So this is what, let's see. So I started working on that. So this is like 10 years ago. That's not long ago at all. I, you know? Wow. Yeah. Wow. So I, I, yeah. So, so, so I just, I just want to ask really quickly here for, for the audience who might be curious about this. Um, are we being taught and have we been taught and we're continued to be taught, certainly as women and maybe as men, not to talk about sex? I mean, in an intelligent way, in an intelligent way. You so know what I, mean? I think I think and I, this is not to be political, right? No, because no. Going, right. I think that I think that we. Um, what is missing? First of all, we have groups of people who will not talk about sex they'll okay. say don't teach about even the 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 anatomy the physiology around sex and reproduction in schools right they also are not going to talk about it at home we don't call body parts by their names uh right. i have children i have children my youngest 
at a really young age when they were trying to figure out the difference between boys and girls, they would say, do you have a vulva to people, you know, to understand <laughs> people would be shocked. That's the name. That is the yeah. actual name of the body part. Yeah, I'm just I, I'm just smiling because I'm thinking that most of them probably wouldn't have known what a vulva was. But also, secondly, that your child knew. So way to go, mom. She also, she also knows words like foreskin, right? And knew wow. what that was too. But So, so oh. we go with that. Yep. And the other thing that once we start to talk about and teach about sex and sexuality in this kind of uh, patho pathology, right? Yep. Reproduction yeah. yeah. disease we leave out something really essential, which is pleasure. Of course we do. Of course we do. Cause we're not supposed to feel, we're not supposed to feel pleasure. I don't know. Right, right, exactly. Or yeah. wait, or wait, hide that we, we enjoy uh, pleasure. Yeah. 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 Okay. So we're not, we're not talking about pleasure. And yeah. when we really break down uh, talking about sex and sexuality, we're, we're actually talking about a quality of life issue. It's which, quality of life. Which I can guarantee probably almost nobody thinks about in that way or talks about it. Would yeah. you agree? Would you agree? Yes. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Kind of fasting forward to my trajectory. So I was, I, I ended up talking to patients about sex and sexuality at the bedside, talking to my colleagues and then running groups for people over 60 and doing grand rounds about the importance of talking about sex and sexuality and exploring and understanding that, that there's no normal, everything. If you like something, there are about a million people who like that thing too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so that there's so much normal. And I learned a ton about sex and sexuality with when, when I was working with people who were older. Mm -hmm. Like a penis is not necessary for having sexual intercourse mm -hmm, mm -hmm. when you have somebody who's a male bodied person, right? Mm -hmm. That there's so much that you can do uh, around expressing your, your sexual self. Now, the whole concept of erotic, which, I, which you're going to ask me about a little bit, that actually came way before I became a nurse. Okay. And this concept of, of, we have to think beyond that pathological, biological body parts, right? What's mm -hmm. below our waist and think bigger because that concept of pleasure, that concept of quality of life comes from so many different directions. Eventually, I ended up working in what they call an acute, a long-term acute care facility, which there were two types of patients. Uh, those patients that were um, had wounds, heavy wounds that needed to be addressed, like bed sores, uh, diabetic wounds, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, that was a small portion. And the primary function of that hospital was hospice care. Okay. End of life. Mm -hmm. And even there, the erotic... And that idea of the sexual being and the idea of pleasure at the end of life being a quality of life issue was like slap me in the face. And one of the first questions that they ask, and not all nurses would ask, but if you read the intake mm -hmm. was, do you have any sexual concerns that you want to address? Okay. Because that's one of the things that so many of the people who are passing on or moving into that next phase of their journey. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, would use to feel a sense of aliveness. Okay. This is all kind of new to me. So it's interesting. It's, yeah. Interesting. And it doesn't mean that they were having, some people were having sex. Right. But right. it means that they were connecting on this deeper, intimate, level of being seen of being vital of being alive if only for that moment you know it reminds me do you remember that show like a hundred years ago uh 30 something yes i do actually there was the one couple and she got breast cancer 
So okay. I was, I'm 50 years old. So okay. I was a kid. Yeah. Definitely like a solid child <laughs> yeah. at that point. I don't know if I was a young teenager. I don't know if I was a preteen. I don't remember. Yeah. But I remember watching this and I remember there's a scene where they make love. Okay. And she's already had uh, maybe a double mastectomy. I don't remember. No hair. She's got a scarf on. Right. And the idea of them having this connection. Yeah. And that she needed to have this connection with him. Right. Yeah. Healing. So that profoundly affected you? Yeah. Right. Yeah. I think you were tapping in if from, you know, into your purpose work at a young, a younger age, a much younger age, which some people really do. Yeah. Um, like for me, I would bang out when I was 12 years old stories on a, on an Olivetti typewriter. I remember having that big lug of a thing on my bed and I'd type out stories and ultimately I did become a writer. So I do think we can tap into that. And that's maybe what that was doing for you, that episode, uh, showing you some of what your work was going to be as an adult, which is really kind of cool. Yeah, you know? maybe. But at the same time, like, who are you going to tell? Like, you, you like, oh, I like yeah. That's yeah. really, that is a very powerful scene for a kid who had no, uh, nobody had had that diagnosis in my family. It was not right. a family life that right. was anything like my own, yeah. right? But, but in, uh, when I went to college, I was introduced to the work of Audre Lorde. And okay. that's where this whole concept of erotic power comes. So back to the nursing I became a nurse practitioner because it gave me more tools to not only talk about sex and sexuality with patients and people, but offer different solutions, whether that is hormones, whether that was, I didn't know, it just, or even working with adolescents in a particular way. Um, and from there, from my work, uh, of teaching and talking one on one, I started coaching people. Okay. And that evolved into what I call uh, this concept of erotic power coaching from the poet and um, theorist Audre Lorde, okay. who is the person who came up with that. And what she was saying is that I actually have, um, if I can read something, it says, there sure. are many kinds of power used and unused, acknowledged or otherwise. The erotic is a resource within each of us that lies in a deeply female and spiritual plane, firmly rooted in the power of our unexpressed or unrecognized feelings. Wow, that's beautiful, actually. And it, it takes some thinking about, right? It takes some rereading and really thinking about that. Um, because we're going to talk about this in a minute, but the definition of erotic, the definition of wisdom, um, I do a lot of work in personal power. And for me, this is another branch of it that I'm not even really versed on to the degree I, sh I would like to be uh, for a fulfilling life. And I'm going to wager most of my audience and most of women and um, and, and maybe men, because I was going to ask you, is this... Is this also, this is not gender specific, is it? No, not at all. Okay, so as individuals, a lot of us are not versed in erotic power and erotic wisdom. Hence, yeah, yeah right? right? No, I was just going to say the reason for this show is to give your work a voice, a bigger voice, and help us all understand the importance of this. So when you're ready, we're going to talk into how we can understand erotic and how we excuse me, how we can understand wisdom that is not pornographic and physically sexual only, which so many people have a lot of hangups about. So yeah. taking it back. So after your work, after your, you became sort of, I would say Audre Lorde became what a mentor for you. Like even if it was just her work, like her books, like this was a path for you to follow, right? Like I'll let you explain how she impacted you. So she, so I was introduced to the work of Audre Lorde through my teacher from undergrad. Okay. And her, I did, a, my first degree was on feminist inquiry, cultural studies with an emphasis on gender, race, third world feminism. Okay. So she was the person who introduced me to this work of Audre Lorde. 
And it's like those little seeds were planted. And as I was trying to understand that it was more talking about sex and sexuality is not about what's in our pants, right? It's so much more. And when we think about getting hung up on sex and sexuality, like it, it's really getting hung up on what we should, we should all over ourselves, right? Well, I should be this and I should have sex this many times and I should be that and I should be that and he should have this or she should have that and getting hung up on that as well. Instead of saying, you know, I feel I'm in that power, that flow, that excitement, that deep excitement when I'm at the typewriter. I could write my writings on the computer, but when my fingers are on the keys and I hear that tick, 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 tick that happens on the actual physical typewriter, it just like literally sends electric chills through my body. And the idea is that you feel those chills through your body and you can actually feel them in your genitals too. Mm -hmm. It's that knowing that it's there. And that is the initiation. That's the spark that can take you to the next thing. Right. And that is that erotic power. I'm almost thinking as you're talking that um, I recently did a, a an episode with someone on breath work and how vital that is to our life force. And as you're talking, I'm I'm thinking about how not that we think of it this way, that we could think of the genitalia and the sensations in our genitalia as also life force energy that we, right. But that we have been so conditioned to associate it with anything perverted or negative or, um, not allowed, you know, all of those really, really, uh, puritan type values it's so hard to break it i think i think on a very conscious level particularly in north america uh i can't speak to any other culture but we're so repressed because it's just so associated with everything that we've been taught to think of as pretty well bad or private would you agree You know, it's interesting because I call my my website is private parts of wellness because there's a difference between privacy and secrecy. Yes. Okay. Yeah. When we think about secrecy, it's shame. Yes. Privacy is only just that. Yes. Doesn't mean that I that you have to share your private erotic fantasy. I think that there's I think that there's that puritan puritanical. Thing, uh, but and I'm going to say something very controversial, probably for for your audience, right? Okay. Um, when we get down from patriarchy, misogyny, puritanism, really at the foundation, we have this concept of supremacy and white supremacy, which all people are affected by. White people, black people, all people are affected by, and and what I mean by that is not, it's not calling people names. It's not, that's not what I'm saying right now. I am saying that if we think about North America, I am going to talk about these 50 United States, right? Or these 50 states that seem very ununited, right? But these 50 states below Canada. Yeah. Um, If you think about this whole idea of imperialism and supremacy and kind of how we create things it's 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 really very steeped in our culture these 50 states and again and it comes back in these ways of repression of of um of withholding of shaming of putting people down of suppressing, suppressing people. Uh, So because I'll just jump, I'll just jump in really quick because there's a lot of shame associated with um, sexual feelings, sexual gratification. Um, There's a lot of shame. And so if I'm hearing you right, um, I'm, I'm hearing that I want to clarify two things. One physical sensations uh, you're saying can awaken the erotic in us that to me, I'm thinking you're meaning just the senses, all of the senses, including our genitalia, hence the uh, erotic. Um, 
the other thing is I want to clarify with you is what you're saying is because of the way the United States developed in Canada, and it was this whiteness, um, we've been taught, uh, so some would say that you and I having this conversation might be blaming the white patriarchal society or holding that accountable for why we have repressed and suppressed a lot of our sexual feelings and our ability to uh, express ourselves yes. uh, in whatever way we want to do it. And it's uncomfortable. We, we might go, oh, well, we can really watch Madonna express herself and that's okay, but I can't do it. I might do it privately in my room in front of a mirror, but I would never let anyone know that I have those same moves and all the rest of it. But so, so the white, the, the whiteness of our um, birthing of a nation, I believe, well, we are a patriarchal society. No one is denying us that. And I think the woke culture and maybe the new generation coming up and following generations will try and, and change that. But we are what we are, you know, from who we were. were. Yeah. And basically, and so... Not to bash men, not to bash whiteness, not to bash anything. This is just a reality. And so, but the other thing I want to throw in there, so I've confirmed that, that's what we're talking about. But the other thing I just want to really quickly um, ask you is, do, do you think the suppression and repression of sexual expression, sexual confidence, sexual pleasure, all of those things in North America... We'll just talk about North America here. Is culture and that other cultures, I'm not saying every culture, but other cultures are more open to their sexuality um, as a culture and individually. So in other words, I'm asking, is sex related to cultural norms? I think that when it comes to North America, no matter what you look like or what your home culture is, yeah. Every human being, every human being has this uh, response that is very uh, American. It's very encultured in America, right? Yeah. yeah. I think that other cultures outside of these 50 United States that uh, look at the body and they see breasts as breasts that feed human beings they see uh, a, a, a culture that is, you know, has nude beaches or has, you know, sees other body parts that are, they're just body parts. It's not a thing. It's just, a, it's just as it is. They're just body parts. You know what I mean? I, yeah, I, I'm going to, I'm going to go on a limb here and say, I think a lot of it is cultural. Um, we lived in Holland for three years, actually when my son was an infant, we lived not very far from a nude beach and, um, there's a lot of, uh, and the regular beach was topless. And so you wear a bathing suit top as a woman. You didn't have to, didn't matter. It was very normalized. Absolutely. And, and in a lot of European countries, going topless for a woman is very, very normalized. And one day I took the kids, uh, popped my son in his stroller, and maybe he was a year or two, my daughter, and maybe she was 13 or something. And I was like, oh, let's go over the, the dunes. Let's go this way to the beach. And little did I know it, we walked smack dab into the nudist beach. Yeah. And I was like, okay. And it wasn't about me being like freaked out about it. It was more about subjecting my daughter. So I just made as normal and we strolled our way through it and pushing that little stroller through the sand and just, well, here we are. I just want to focus on culturally how affected we really are. And in Canada, it is the same. I want to talk a little bit about erotic gaze here because, um, you actually helped me in uh, in, a, in a private Zoom chat with that and, and understanding the love. If you could just explain that again for other women here who um, we were talking about it in, in association with pain in the womb when you lose a child mm -hmm. and yeah. why we deaden ourselves, why we become deadened. Uh, so... So it's kind of interesting. So this is sort of twofold. In terms of the erotic gaze, when, when you first look at your child, and I'll let you explain it, but I took away from that how you could love. So when, when any, whenever 
parents have a new baby, the majority of them say they have they feel a love like they never felt before. It's different from the love they feel for each other. It's different for any other love they've ever had. It is completely on a different level. We're talking about this as the erotic gaze. And if you could explain how it's your baby that is receiving the gaze and the, we'll just speak to the mom at this point, or well, maybe the dad too, gazing at that child. And that is purely erotic. So if you could just touch on that a little bit and um, clarify for their, our, our audience, my audience here, what exactly that means for us as an empowering, you know, change in the body. So I want to say a couple things. So, um, so Audrey Lord says for the erotic is not a question only of what we do. It is a question of how acutely and fully we can feel in the doing. Okay. That's beautiful. And when we think about, so eros is love erotic is love pornography is graphy of prostitution right okay it is that kind of graphic thing yeah when we think about eros it is love it is a deep love that can be expressed in the body right of people coming together yes and out of their love and and attachment, yes, they create a life. Yes, let's say right. Yes, yes. When we talk about the erotic gaze in one way, in relationship to how we understand ourselves as erotic beings as adults, okay. My understanding is that when we look back as adults, and I'm going to go back, I'm going to circle back to birth. Yeah. When we, as adults, when we think back and we have an image of our primary caretakers looking at us, yeah. What is that look we see? Is it that love? Is it annoyance? Is it disregard? Is it hatred? What is it that we see them looking, their gaze? And that is the, that is kind of the, the starting point of our association with the erotic. Yes, we and and some people might need to take a minute here and just think about it. And for me, when we talked about that the first time, and I went back to those first moments when you look at your child and um, your baby, but then I don't think that look ever kind of really goes away. No, it, not really. It might alter a little bit, obviously, as you're kids become older and adults and so on and so forth. But so I want you to just expand a little bit. So we're talking about a baby receiving a human being in their very first minutes, seconds, minutes, hours, and months, and however long, if they're lucky. Years, hopefully. Years. So Years. we're talking about like a five-year-old looking back at their mom. Yes. Yeah, so Three-year-old. So now they're totally conscious and they're looking back. But also as the parent, yeah. what do you see back when you think of your the gaze you receive? Yeah, and that's what I wanted to talk about a minute here is so for us to think about that and we're experiencing erotic in that moment yes but as the adults uh, well both of us the baby is experiencing it we're experiencing it experiencing it as the one giving the gaze the baby's receiving but also gazing back at us because while we're sitting there going well they don't really know yet maybe well I'm wondering if they do know that it's mama but you know there is a bond that cannot be broken and that bond never ever 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 breaks even after your child is no longer on the planet and while we're not talking about that today maybe another conversation it's so important to understand when we can't break the cycle of pain which is why you and I got talking about the erotic gaze it is because we're still in that moment that love so I wanted you to just explain what the individual they can feel it for themselves just thinking back to their first memories of looking at their their newborn and but how their parents looked at them Vaughn, it's like how did your parents look at you not 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 like that not like that which is interesting right <laughs> we carry that in yes yes i have no memory of that no memory of feeling safe so a beautiful erotic gaze that is 
not dysfunction. A lot of us come from dysfunction. If you're very fortunate that you came from safety and security in that beautiful gaze that never goes away, it must be an incredible feeling, but I didn't come from that. My parents did their best, but they didn't listen. We, d we came from dysfunction, which a lot of people do come from. But sticking to what we as individuals can gaze upon our children, our babies today, and our even, you know, I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying we're going to do this with our adult children, but that it stirs up those feelings, those immediate feelings we had when we first laid eyes on them. Yeah. And we want the best for them. And those might become a little bit more subconscious than conscious, but that feeling never goes away. That bond is there. I mean, I still light up when my son phones. Yeah. And, and so if you could just speak a little bit to that, because this is where we're going to move into the power of that. This is what maybe, I'm not sure if it drives us, but it is such an essential part of us as erotic beings. I'm trying to think in a new way of being an erotic being here. Um, so if you could just explain when we're the one giving the gaze, what's happening to us inside our bodies? So, so at that moment, like when we think about the nervous system, most likely, well, here's the thing. I don't, I can't say that this is the thing that's happening to everyone, right? Of course not. If you are having, so let's say that you've associated, my father said, he said, Jess, we did our best and our best was. S H finish it. Yeah. Oh, we did our best and our best was. Yeah. No, it didn't. That felt great to me when he said that. Why? Because it was a validation. It's not a gaslighting thing. It says like, yeah, everything that yeah. you think was off and that you had wolves raising you is true. The wolves did raise you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We're all on the same page. We're all yeah. taking responsibility for what we've done. Love that. Truth. It's truth. Power and truth. Yep. Okay. So let's talk about just this. Let's use the word sex. Let's okay. talk about sexual beings in the context of erotic and okay. loss. Yes. When we think back and we say, so we have a family that did not give us that gaze. When we look back and we look for that gaze from our own family, it was not there. Yeah. We vow to do different. We vow to do different. Yes. We fail all over and over and over again. Right? Once these Yes, you can feel that if you can feel that if you've lost a child for sure. Yeah. Even if you haven't lost a child, but even right? If you haven't. Yeah. You lost your your collective doo-doo because they were throwing things and you hadn't slept in three days. Oh, I see what you're saying. I fail over and over. Got it. We have a chance to do better. Yes. And in extreme loss, which I haven't experienced that I can't even, we cannot like literally those of us who have not experienced it, cannot imagine it because it is too painful to even imagine. Okay. I get it. So we're not going there. We're talking in general terms and just... just we are going to go there because what we know in science is that our DNA changes by three generations. Okay. I did not know that. Yeah. So the trauma, oh. in particular with trauma, the trauma that three generations back your family went through is in your DNA. When you had your baby, we're all so connected. When you had your baby... Maybe your your baby and you are sleeping in the bed, taking mm -hmm. a nap, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden you both wake up and you're both sleeping like this. Oh, well, you don't sleep like this. Yeah. But there's the baby sleeping like this, and you're sleeping like this. Oh, I'll bet you that's happened to most most parents. Yeah, yeah it happens because yeah. you're connected. Yeah. Okay. Deeply connected. That is how acutely and fully you are feeling in that moment. Mm -hmm. So when that's taken away, when that loss happens, and even when your kid goes to college, right? I've just experienced sending my firstborn off to college. Yes. My response that I've noticed is to shut off as everything readjusts. Hmm. Because I'm launching her into her adulthood. Yes, you are. So now, now there's one place 
one table setting at the table that's not being filled. Yes. Yes. Right. Yeah. So now I have to deal with my own grieving in a certain way. Yes. My own loss. Yes. What does that mean? Am I less of a parent? Right. Am I less of a parent to her? Whatever that is, whatever like thoughts yeah. are coming through my head. Of course. But now I have a partner too. Mm -hmm. So that should make more space for my partner. Okay. Less attention on that other person, more space for my partner. I don't know. Yeah. Might not necessarily work that way. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you got a lot to think about. And uh, there's uh, millions of people who are sending their uh, kids off to college for the first time. And um, yeah, I, uh, I know I went through a uh, terrible breakdown in terms of not people wouldn't have known it, but inside when my son left home at 22, he lived with us uh, from, you know, through his, his university year. So I didn't have to deal with that, but I can, I can imagine that when he lived, moved across the country, um, you know, it, it probably possibly in part just set me on a spiral where I ended up just having to alter my life. Well, I came out West too. And we're not living in the same place. But anyway, I'm just saying it impacted me terribly. Absolutely. And I didn't understand what was going on at the time. So I'm thinking, because the other thing that going off to college kind of represents for a lot of people is that they're not coming home again to live. You said you're launching them into the world and that's it, you know, and it, it is a loss. So you and I talked about that before, like that is an absolute loss. Uh, and, and a complete readjustment for you as the parent and the partner, you know, the parents and the, and the siblings, the whole family unit. Yeah. But here's the scariest bit about yeah. it. Yeah. That has now made space for you to get on that typewriter and feel the sensation and hear the noise and let that energy and that erotic power, that erotic energy that you focused on him and her to come back to you. Yeah, you really have to, it's it's very, very, I knew this was gonna be a lot to unpack in this conversation and we may not be able to unpack everything today. Um, but I do wanna move a little bit into, we're just, audience, we're just giving examples of, um, mostly we've been talking about, uh, you know, just in the last few minutes about losing something and what that can change and do to us. But I want to actually just focus a little bit here. In your work, you say that, you know, you help people, your your job is to guide people to find those things that lay dormant in them and, you know, their way back to passion and purpose. So if we can, at this point uh, in the conversation, bring it to what erotic power really feels like. We've talked about the erotic gaze with children, connection, things like that. But as an individual now, because we're using language people aren't used to. And um, so as an individual, it's not, I remember you saying, it's not about the other person at all. No. It's just, it's just about us. It's about what those feelings are inside of us. So can you sort of expand a little bit on erotic power, what it feels like in all of our senses. Yes, you're using the example of a writer. Um, I'm going to say not necessarily me, but I still have the vision of typing at 12 years old. And, um, but even just using the language that when something changes and we can view it as a loss, but it's, it's a change of whatever, and it's it empty and it's making space in our life, let's think of it as that. It's making space in our life for something else to happen. Now, when our kid goes off to college, well, we're happy. There, there, we can make space probably a little bit easier than if you've lost a child, because you know, and in a normal world, you're gonna see them for Thanksgiving, other holidays, you can go and visit each other, they're expanding, they're going into the world as their fullest, most brilliant, successful selves. But when they're no longer on the planet, that is a completely different 
topic, and I, we really don't have time to talk about that today, uh, but it is just very different, and I just want to acknowledge that many people maybe that watching uh, or listening to this have not lost children because most, most more people haven't lost children than have, so I don't want to just focus on that today. But when we've had similar loss, that has impacted us where it might be easier to try and reclaim our erotic power. This episode is awakening to our erotic wisdom. So let's even talk about it in terms of erotic wisdom. Because maybe it was something that flattened us that was a broken relationship, a divorce, financial bankruptcy or other financial troubles, getting fired and you just never got over that boss that kept berating you and, you know, maybe fired or, you know, fired you or forced you to quit. Maybe you never pursued the dreams that you really wanted. Maybe you're just living a life that feels dull and purposeless and um, asking, you know, what's the point? So for any of those dulled senses, if you could expand a little bit here on what erotic wisdom erotic purpose but I really also love the term erotic wisdom what's that what does that really how does that empower people when they can connect to it so how can they think of connecting to it and how can they expect to feel empowered by it I think the first thing to know is that it is available to everyone and it is within everyone, number one. Number two, it doesn't mean that you're going to hear angels singing and this kind of transcendental uh, acknowledgement. It is in this subtle, the subtle details. It's in the, in the being present. Mm -hmm. For me, it's conversation right? It's when I'm running groups. It's when I'm, I'm like engaging with people, right? I feel this excitement. There's energy. I can feel it all throughout my body. For some people, it's going to be cooking or eating a particular thing, not some, not necessarily an Oreo, right? Mm -hmm. But something that is, uh, it could be an Oreo, right? But like not being thoughtless, but being thoughtful, full of thought around something that is simple. Yeah. And from there, it becomes a starting point. So I just, I want to use like, for example, I'm going to paint a picture as if this is somebody, right? Yeah. So let's go back to this writer and the tactile of the typing. Yeah. So that person buys a typewriter at the Goodwill mm -hmm. and they get a paper and they just start typing whatever it is. It's just not a should. It's not an assignment. It's not a deep um, have to do. It's mm -hmm. that's the first thing that came to them. And they take a moment mm -hmm. to listen to the ticking and feeling what it feels like are the is it the square is it the square buttons from the almost electric typewriters is it the round one the round buttons where the 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 letters get caught you yeah. know <laughs> yeah that things you know that 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 yeah yeah the keys the keys is it you know what is it do you have a brother word processor where you used to have the one line the one sentence that would appear in the thing right okay what is it and it's noticing that and it's noticing the excitement or the fun or the frustration right that comes up it's that it's that excitement right it's that awareness now that same person wrote a letter mm -hmm. they decided to do their journal entry with the typewriter mm -hmm. and they're putting it out there and all of a sudden they wrote a three line poem oh and they started to write a story and it got gets a little spicy yeah right yeah. just a little spicy Maybe yeah. the person enters a room. Maybe I don't know. Whatever that spice is. Yeah, yeah. And all of a sudden they start to think about, and this doesn't happen in one setting. This is like going back to that typewriter in a week, in a month, in two months, in three months. But all of a sudden they start to remember that they love it when their lover 
would whisper in their ear. Mm -hmm. And th then we're starting to take, we're starting to take that private, that energy, that erotic energy, those private thoughts, and almost putting out a prayer, right? Or an image, a visual, a calling in to a partner if the partner is what you want. Mm. I Well, I would absolutely think that people are thinking that who either are in a relationship and um, in love and all of those feelings, and that might, you know, ignite these feelings in them brought on by their absolute love of the object that is the typewriter, the feel of the paper, and, and then it ignites uh, and brings awareness to all these other senses that all work together. Um, maybe it's somebody uh, who is wanting a relationship may see and, and imagine all this in, in just looking at a flower bloom. The point I want to get across that it is about the erotic wisdom, the erotic power is about the senses. Yeah. And the connecting to the senses through any number of means when we are mindful of what the body is picking up biologically and mentally and emotionally. Have I pretty much got that? Yes, because this concept of wisdom erotic power is not mine, right? And she says, for the erotic is not a question only of what we do. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. not a question of sex. It is a question of how acutely and fully we can feel in the doing. Yeah, I like that. We're feeling acutely and fully in the typing, in the writing, mm -hmm. in the eating, mm -hmm. in the cooking, in the uh, walking, uh, in the reading, in the listening, yeah. in the shopping. Don't put yourself into financial problems, but <laughs> right? Whatever you're doing. And she says then, of course, Women so empowered, and this would be men too. This is humans so empowered are dangerous. <laughs> it can awaken a lot within us, our personal power, where we, where there is no stopping us once we've uh, connected to our personal power. And this, this, it all works together. So personal power, erotic power. Uh, emotional power, any of this power is really, uh, for me, how I'm, how I'm interpreting this is a full awakening of all parts of the body and mind emotions that when we are very aware of how we are functioning in the doing, I love, I love, I love that it is how acutely and fully we can feel in the doing of what we are doing, it is such a, a powerful way to honor ourselves, especially if we're doing what we want to be doing. But, and a lot of people aren't, and we don't have really time to talk about that today. And I do a lot of work in helping people understand what they really want to be doing to live very, very authentically, particularly if you've come from very trying circumstances. But that is what it ultimately is all about, is living for me anyway, our most authentic and powerful, personally powerful life of which the erotic senses, it's just another way to think of yourself. We love ourselves. Isn't that what it's all about? Loving and respecting and honoring ourselves. Yeah. Because going back to what you said, Eros is love. And it is a lot easier for, I think, a lot of people to express that for someone else but how many really express the erotic, the love for themselves? No, this is one of the biggest problems humans have and look to it through um, others. And so even taking one of the things that stood out for me is when you're saying the connection, it's the connection. So what we're fl doing is flipping it a little bit here by saying where a person might be culturally even conditioned to look for their empowerment through another individual, possibly what they're doing, right? Like moving into moving into a powerful career or, you know, some kind of position where you have power over others but feel absolutely nothing for yourself. So the whole point of this is to feel all of that for ourselves and act from that, do from that place 
And what I was going to say in addition to all of this is that the more powerful we feel and connect to all these parts of ourselves, including our genitalia, the thing that we use to birth other individuals, to demonstrate love for one another, and so on and so forth. Yeah. The more we create the life we really want. Would you not agree? Yeah. I think that, it, remember, sex is a quality of life issue. Yeah. And you don't necessarily need your genitals to have a sexy life. Yeah, well, so when you say sex is a quality of life, but then a sexy life, how do you define a sexy life? That would be whatever it is. Everything we're talking about in whatever we connect to, however um, aware we become of those feelings within us. It's just a different way of thinking about all those feelings within us and I, I, I do get what you're saying, and it's a little hard for me to express because I still have to digest a lot of this, but it goes back for me, the thing that really triggered me to those deep, deep feelings of the, the love that we have already within ourselves, that everybody is capable of feeling for themselves. I feel it most clearly about my power in that through that erotic gaze example. Yeah. Uh, and so I'll work on expanding that to other areas because I know that's really what you're, I, I will, at least I believe that's what you're really talking about and be able to, able to feel that in the cooking or the writing or the gardening or the walking in the forest or whatever it is that triggers that same energy, which today we're calling erotic energy, right? Yeah, I wanted to ask you, and by the way, at the end, I will give you all of Jessica's uh, contact details, her website, it'll be in the description as well. So that for anybody that wants to pursue uh, more study with Jessica, coaching with Jessica or other things, resources on her website, you'll be able to do that as well. But before we get to that part, um, Jessica, I just wanted to ask if you would have any um, tips for, um, I could say advice, you're a nurse, so I'll say advice, for people who are alone, for people who, because when we think as part of this, um, it is kind of a process, you have to embrace it in your life and let it work its magic. And part of that to me seems connection is important. And no one I think would undervalue um, the connection with another human being. So what would you say to anybody who may be listening uh, to or watching this who's absolutely alone and um, maybe they are blessed already with being able to feel this erotic power and connect to their erotic wisdom, which to me is just understanding about connecting to their erotic power. Um, for the person that really thinks they can't do this or they really don't kind of understand uh, or they, you know, as with me, I have to think about this for a little bit and I have to think about myself in, in, a, in a different way, expanding my thinking about myself in a different way when I think about erotic power and break this cultural thing where, no, no, erotic's not a bad word. It's not a bad word. Uh, you can put it in the title of the podcast, but what would you say to that person who is feeling still pretty battered or is completely alone without connection and, um, you know, uh, is curious about this, how would, how would they even just begin? I know you've probably already talked about this, so this is just sort of to um, just summarize again how they can start to tap into that erotic uh, power and wisdom within themselves. So the first thing is, um, if they are alone and in touch with that erotic power, probably they are not feeling lonely and they probably mm. do have connection, right? Because we are pack animals, we need interconnection, period. Like we live in a, in a and this goes back to that whole uh, controversial statement I made, but we go into this, uh, we, we live in an environment that is so into hyper independence. Yeah. Yeah. Right? yeah. That yeah. is so detrimental, right? and mm -hmm. leaves us all exhausted and lonely and isolated. Mm -hmm. So I think that if that's where you're finding yourself, mm -hmm. that you, there's probably grief behind that. Mm 
Mm-hmm. And part of, for a lot of people, at least how I was raised as well, mm-hmm. that grief is something we do not share. It is as shameful as showing your genitals on Instagram, right? Well, wait, is it shameful or is it private grief? Well, I'm saying that I'm saying, yeah, I think that it's shameful to be such grieving because you're trying, you're fighting on this hyper independence. Mm -hmm. And if there's grief behind it, Mm -hmm. to acknowledge that you have grief is to say, I'm not okay. I need help and I need support. Mm -hmm. And that can lead to shame. And so I think that there is a power in saying, I need to express my grief. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I, I need have, to let yeah. that grief move through me and out of me. Mm-hmm. And by letting grief move through me and out of me, that does not mean that whatever I'm grieving goes away. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like the loss of a family member or the loss of a loved one, right? It doesn't yeah. go yeah. away. Oh. Of course not. But it's there's it's, it's empowering telling our stories and sharing and connecting, even in something that is painful. But the more you connect, this is just for me being able to help the audience here, the more you connect in whatever is painful. And most of us have come from something painful. Doesn't have to be loss, but disappointments, anything. Um, we there's the it feels better at, when we can share our stories and understand that we're not the only one going through what we're going through. And um, so I did just want to want to point again to what you're saying about this independence and this hyper independence can lead to isolating circumstances and in isolating circumstances, we do lose our power. Whether we think we do or we don't, we do, because I think it's about the interconnectedness that is so vital to our as pack animals are blossoming. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it is. So I think that you can... If the idea of sitting down at the typewriter, whatever that typewriter is for you, is overwhelming, I think that the first thing to be done is to make connection and search for the erotic gaze from the people Mm. that you start to feel connected to. Or maybe, well, I was just going to say, or maybe a pet, right? Even a pet. A pet can, but yeah. I'd, re- I'd, I'd really love you to have a human being to connect to. And it doesn't okay. mean, and when, when people are, uh, you know, when people are, but, but that's just me, you know, I'm not uh, yeah. like, I don't know enough about like animal stuff and like pet stuff. And no, but you do know the science and, and some of the science for sure and human connection. So let's, then let's be really clear about this. Human connection is vital for us. Yes. Well, we we know that babies will die if they're not touched. Okay. All right. So people, it's human connection. This is why I've always, I used to start my lectures saying like, the reason New York City has so many nail salons is because we need to be touched. (laughs) To be touched. We need to be touched. We need to be seen. So uh, this is not to say that this person that is feeling lonely, hyper independent, you know, whatever that is, right, should go and you know, look for romantic connection. That's not what I'm saying. No. And that in the connections that they do have or in finding community, whether it's the grieving, whatever that is, Mm -hmm. notice if there is a touch, even a taste, even the sense of erotic gaze from the people you are connecting with. If you don't have your own typewriter. You're using that as an analogy, folks, which I'm sure everybody understands here, but it's, and it can be very hard to start a connection, but um, I'll just give a very quick example that I just read about these three dads in the UK who uh, lost their daughters to suicide. Uh, This is all within the last, I think, two to three years. And um, by connecting, they've brought other, showing the strength of, of fathers together. They are actually becoming an activist group, Three Men Walking, it's called. But this other uh, fellow just lost his son at 17 to suicide very, very recently. So he joined the Three Dads Walking on a walk. He maybe isn't interested in the activism part of it, but that's not the point. The article I read was by the connection, he immediately felt less alone 
less isolated in his grief and the the death and it has changed his life he's not all better it's not about that it's there's hope and where there's connection there's hope there are so many possibilities there's so much potential there's also healing and i can attest to that so it's it's human connection people right yes, you can do it imperfectly yes that's a good point imperfectly so yeah. you can go and just show up yeah. i'm tim i'm yes. sally whatever yes. your name is but i yeah. can't really talk <laughs> right yes but yes. just keep showing up you keep showing up you yeah. keep showing up yeah. right yeah and yeah and for many people like you may be in a place where i live they have newcomers groups and i just want to throw this out there for people to even think about that you don't have to have just moved to the city your circumstances could have changed and they are just as welcoming so if it's really really hard to go out and i mean it's hard to go out and like make a friend so the goal maybe isn't being a friend like making a friend the goal is just to have some human connection and maybe a handshake maybe a hug with a quick hug with somebody whatever right join a gardening club yeah sorry oh, an exercise class yeah anything yoga exercise there's so many ways yeah, yeah you go you go to yeah. an exercise class and uh, you know if that teacher hopefully you get a teacher who acknowledges your presence yeah and says i'm glad you're here yeah i mean i can go to a coffee shop and and sit and, and have a conversation with just about anybody i could have a conversation with someone in a grocery store i you know for me it's very very easy but we're just acknowledging here we're not telling anyone what to do we're just acknowledging the importance of connection uh in addition to everything else we've said that will not uh give you erotic power and wisdom it will expand and maybe blow it wide open for you with just a start of connecting right just starting a connection did I get that? Did I get that right? Did I get that right? Yeah. Open light. And then if all else fails, there's psychedelic medicine. Oh, oh my goodness sakes. Anyway, I, I, this is, this was so much to unpack and talk about partly because it's new information for many people and uh, certainly new information for me. And it's a new way of challenging ourselves to think and be, and that takes time. So this conversation just today was not about like, okay, you know, we're all going to go out and have this down pat. You're farther along because this is your field. This is your work and you've been at it for a long time and clearly it's your passion. It's your purpose. And so you've been working this. So you're the example of what you are able to teach and say, this works, this works. This is what we need based on from the people you you've learned from. And it's just another way of being. And I'm so, so grateful that we met and that I'm opening myself up because there's a gentleness to the energy, at least mine, when I think about the love for myself. And if I can, you know, think and go erotic isn't a bad word. Erotic is just, it was that gaze I had for my babies. And they brought that out in me. And now I want to find other things in life that bring that out and empower me as well. And that is what's going to be the journey. And you see, and I might feel that I'll speak personally here from my flowers that grow. I used to be quite the gardener and I lost all of that ability uh, when my daughter passed away and had someone come look after my gardens. And now I'm in a condo and I do balcony gardening and I truly can say I appreciate and love. Yes, there must be erotic energy awakened within me when I look at my flowers growing. And I am so proud of myself because it doesn't stop at just the flowers growing. It, it allows me to respect all of the work and all of the doing I did to get those flowers growing. So I am definitely going to practice thinking about myself in this way going forward and how I'm doing and to close out with this, how we are ac acutely and fully feeling uh, in that moment of our doing. I'm paraphrasing a bit, but I'm going to pay a lot of conscious um, attention to that because for me, it does bring me back to feeling empowered uh, and overtaking those 
negative feelings of guilt and regret and shame and all the other things I have felt for far too long as the result of my daughter choosing to leave the planet. And then you can think you're a really bad parent and all that kind of stuff. But I be, I'll be doing coaching calls on all of that too. And this is one new avenue I can bring in about an awareness for the body um, in as a result of our conversation today. So I do thank you uh, for that very, very much, Jessica. Now, I want to just close a little bit with knowing that you have resources. And if you want to speak a little bit to... Um, I know that your uh, the website that people can find things again. I'll be putting the link below. But just if you wanna, you have a couple of, uh, of sites that you take people to and what you do. And if you could just share that, that would be wonderful. Sure. So the first thing that I would urge everyone to do is to read Audrey Lord's um, piece on the uses of the erotic, the erotic as power, where that's where that whole. Um, those quotes that I was reading, that's where they're from, uh, because she is just, she puts all of those words together. Those are her words that really spoke to you. Yes. My website is the uh, is privatepartsofwellness.com. So privatepartsofwellness.com. And I, I do a couple things. I have a blog there, and I also lead a group called the Mistresses of the Menopausal Mind which is a mastermind for people who are um, interested in uh, menopause, mm -hmm. uh, in perimenopause, going through the symptoms, or even postmenopause. And we uh, have, we meet twice a month and we do group coaching. And we also have experts who come on and talk about not just what we think about menopause, but on money and on sex and uh we're doing tonight. In fact, we have an expert talking about um, integrative and functional medicine. We all always talk about menopause, but um, human design, uh, psychedelics and movement. So and beauty, all of those things. Wow. And then in New York State, I do. Um, I do see some patients as well. Um, but and then there's always coaching. But I have a blog. I, I heard it's kind of interesting. You know, <laughs> some of the stuff I write, people yeah. seem to like it. Okay. Um, and uh, yeah, and that's all available on privatepartsofwellness.com. On Instagram, you can follow me at Jessica underscore Jolie, J-O-L-I-E. That's mm -hmm. my middle name. Underscore yeah. N-P. Um, and I'm, that's where I am on Instagram. And yeah. Send me questions, send me emails. I love it all. I this is this is this is my this is my this, this is where my energy goes when it's not going other places. Yeah, you can tell you're really really passionate about it. I did sign up for your newsletter which you might know. I will uh put all the links uh, that Jess just mentioned uh in the description uh below and um so I just want to confirm, so in terms of if, any, if anyone is interested in joining your Mistresses of the Menopausal Mind group, they can find that information on your website, Private Parts of Wellness, right? Absolutely. And they can okay. absolutely uh, ask me questions. And yeah. Okay. Well, that is amazing. So uh, this has been enlightening, to say the least. And I hope for anybody uh, watching or listening to this, it is at minimum uh, inviting you to have a, 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 you know, to think differently a little bit about yourself, about the word erotic, about erotic energy, uh, about erotic power and erotic wisdom. See, I said it several times, erotic, erotic. I love it. <laughs> yeah, I love it. I, because the more we say it, the the more comfortable it becomes, and and we don't have to think about it in suppressed and repressed ways. Our power is our power in how in however we think about it, and I'm all about um, expanding it and giving people as much information through various voices uh, on this podcast as they can to think about them uh, themselves and their life differently and in a, in a more empowering way. So thank you so much again, Jessica, for being my guest. It was truly an honor to have you and I'm sure we'll stay in touch and maybe even do something in the future together again. Excellent. Thank you so much. It was really an honor. Thank you.